Hi everyone, my name is Jacob Thompson and today I'm going to be presenting my senior seminar oral and video presentation on theater technology advancements, starting with my thesis, which I'll read aloud. The theater has and always will be a place where technology, design, imagination, perspective can all come together in order to teach and provide insight into valuable lessons. So a brief look at my overview literature review, the plan is to talk about the advancements that were made from precursor technologies to technologies that we use today. All these slides will be provided if you'd like to read them further, but I'm just going to touch on them briefly and then move on throughout my presentation. So the presentation aims to dissect and reflect on past theatrical technologies used while also providing on how these technologies have helped, have helped create advancements in current technologies we use. So we're going to look at the classical Greek era for a precursor and touch on more modern technology used during Broadway theater today. So for perspective, we start with the uh, Greek theater, because this is where classical theater is grounded. Theater is told uh, through word of mouth traditions uh, throughout all of human history. But when we look to theater history, we talk about Greek theater, because this is where a lot of tropes of theater are uh, resonated and where we grow from. Uh, the classical Greek era is where most of the profound stories that we know of today have touched on and provided uh, that sense of nostalgia with current theater as it evolved through time. Before we get started on Greek theater technologies, we have to understand how light and sound work. So as I'm giving my presentation throughout this empty classroom, sound is being projected and moved throughout the space from a point of origin. It's moving in a wave. And then light travels faster than sound does, just like this projection behind me it's projecting light from a source of origin onto the screen uh, behind me as well. So these technologies used uh, have helped implement all design aspects for uh, theater today, but we're gonna touch firstly on the ancient ruins, or as it is deemed the heterotopias, which are where the performances were performed. So the performances were formed in what are now ancient ruins, and they were cut into hillsides and provided a sound integral acoustic availability for performances uh, to be performed and audiences to understand and hear performance throughout the space. And music was projected greatly in these hillsides as they projected uh, throughout the landscape. So the significance of these ruins is actually pretty profound, profound because we still use these theater spaces today. The ancient ruins are still up and you can go see them if you happen to, if you can afford it. You can go to the spaces and see where these performances were performed in. And even today they still hold true the uh, historical antiquity by performing with the same restrictions of the classical Greek era, same performances in the same space. Although now they're not done, done during the day because the theater was performed uh, during the day during the classical Greek era because that's all the lighting technology they had. Now they're eliminated by artificial lighting technologies, which we'll touch on later. So the significance of these spaces uh, are so profound and so well in touch that they're still used today, like I said. However, some of these performances are scrutinized because uh, the antiquity of the performance is not uh, respected by actors who have never worked in the space. Those who live in the society of the classical Greek uh, area understand the uh, profound integrity of the space. And some actors don't understand that, so they'll cross over a certain seal, and in a way it's disrespecting the culture. Um, although not too much is it disrespected because we still use the spaces today and perform the same shows from years and years and years ago. So one of the technologies that we use for acoustic uh, amplification was masks back in the day. So masks were used to help not only identify and uh, ID profound character like traits, but it was also used to project sound. And even today, I never really touched on this in my paper, but we use makeup now and microphones to not only identify key characteristics of characters, but amplify sound. The makeup uh, allows actors to really augment their face and uh, develop a character more profoundly than just wearing a mask. The Greek chorus uh, also allows for this amplification of many voices to project and provide commentary for a sound. And we still do that today with uh, chorus members in most shows, but uh, the amplification is much better now than it was back then. So scenic aspects that we like to touch on are the deus ex machina, which translates to God of Machine. And this is a type of pulley fly system that was used to fly in actors. 
And we use this still today with the fly rail arbor system, but it has since been implemented in all theaters with a little bit more touch to it besides flying in an actor. Uh, the only other scenic aspect used during the Greek theater was periactos, which was a revolving set. And we use revolving sets today, but not like the Greeks did. They had three scenes on a revolving set. So when you had one scene done, you'd revolve it to the next act, and then the next act after that, and then that'd be the resolution of the show, displaying the three scenes appropriately throughout the show. We at Shawnee State use two sets or uh, two settings on one flat. So it's just a flat board with stage weights that stays up, and then we rotate it for the next scene. Uh, we could use more, but it would just take up more time, and we're not really trained to paint pyramids like the Greeks did. So, touching up on the current fly rail system, uh, heavier drapes, curtains, and even actors are pulled, uh, that can't be pulled by hand, are pulled on a winch line system. And I've provided a photo of the electric line system, which flies in lighting equipment. And this can fly in actors as well, if it's connected to the bat. But this is a representation of all the lights that we use on stage, and these are all flown in by the push of a button. No one could pull this by hand, and if you could, you'd be very, very, very strong. I also provided a view from stage looking out onto the lights, and you can see in the wings here that the light is projected not only on the stage below, but within the wings as well to help provide more uh, illumination for a show. So as we transitioned out of the Greek era, we moved into concert halls and opera houses. And the reason being for this is because architects and performers wanted to create something more grandiose and uh, bigger. And they wanted to enclose the audience and provide uh, more attention to a soloist for an opera. And this transition into the opera houses uh, helped enhance the performer's uh, performance and helped enhance the audience's perspective of a show. Acoustics in concert halls replicate the design and layout of ancient ruins, but they enclose the uh, action within a space. And they're also beautifully decorated and beautifully uh, illuminated too. If you've ever gone into any performance space, it's usually very uh, pretty on the inside uh, with uh, grandiose artwork, and it's actually very fun to uh, project sound and see how the uh, artistry on the walls helps replicate and project that sound. The precursor opera houses were designed with rich, expensive woodworking to help amplify the sound, like I said. And even today, Italian-style opera houses still hold a place in uh, architectural society. We still replicate uh, the uh, buildings of Italian-style opera houses with theaters today, with the proscenium archway. And I provided a photo of the more seating that was able to be uh, implemented with the opera houses with the introduction of the not only orchestra seating but behind this drape here is the mezzanine seating which is the upper balcony and this is the proscenium arch of the italian style opera houses and concert halls it's enclosed in this space here enclosing the action onto the stage and just a little touch up here i like to uh tell people this who've never known this but this orchestra pit raises and lowers and you can actually implement more audience seating by it's on like a sled like pulley system you just push it out onto this and then it raises up and you would never know it's there during the performance it's only done if the orchestra pit isn't needed but and that's usually rare so let's see where we're at the amplification of sounds in these concert halls needed to be done because uh there was no microphones and it wasn't uh, very easy to actually like amplify the performer. So they needed to find ways in which sound could work in a space that was enclosed without taking away from performance. And that's when the implementation of sound shells came to be. Here we go. So when you're on stage performing during a piece, uh, sound actually bounces off these little shells here. And you can do this with or without a microphone. Obviously, wherever you sit, you'll be able to hear the performer on stage. And I like to touch on that. Not only do these sound shells house the sound technology on the outside, but on the inside, there's uh, places where you can hang lights as well and provide more illumination onto the stage. So now we get to touch on my favorite aspect of a show, which is lighting. In most of the shows that were performed here at Shawnee State during my college career, I worked with the lighting more than I did with the sound. Uh, 
lighting is the most important aspect of the show and it's become the most complex uh, theater technology that we will touch on. So in the opera houses and performance halls, the use of candles, uh, lamps, and other fueled sources were used to light these shows. And this created a problem with woodworking because if there was a fire, not only would all the flammable fuse, fuel sources go up, but so would the woodworking. So there needed to be a shift. All these opera houses were built with uh, brick in the later centuries, not only for its uh, ability to carry sound, but to also prevent the burning uh, down of the theaters. So we'll start with the discussion of early lighting technologies and projections, and then we'll slowly work our way into AR technologies. So there's a greater depth and complexity to the phenomena of light, and light is often described as the atmospheric catch-all for a performance. And the discussion of early projections starts with the creator of the submarine, Cornelius Drebbel, who projected uh, images onto people and would photograph them. This was later adapted by choreographer and dancer Lily Fuller. And Fuller was revolutionizing the camera work of light and the theatrical aspect of light by performing this uh, silhouette silk dress dance and projecting colors onto her dress. And her skirt performances was a swirling mass of white silk that she wore and she had these wooden sticks that were attached to the silk dress that helped move the light into space. And her routines encouraged a lot of imitators and it didn't fall too well because they weren't as good a dancer as her. And she actually filmed most of these and would color in the color later on in the editing. And she's actually a revolutionary when it comes to camera work uh, in American contemporary theater. So theaters now run on electricity and it's actually rather dependent. Uh, when the inclusion of lights were a big deal, the uh, inclusion of electricity became more apparent because it became more mainstream and became safer to use electricity to uh, house these lamps and power uh, theaters. So the invention and utilization of electricity in our modern world and modern drama is arguably the biggest advancement of our time, especially theater. Electricity is so necessary that it impacts all aspects of life. Even me using and performing this presentation now, uh, it's, all, it's all I run on. It's all I can really rely on right now. So any show that doesn't need or use electricity is most likely done outside. Uh, light and sound cues uh, are all done on, are all programmed and performed on computers, which all rely on electricity. And the lighting technician uh, or the electrician usually has the hardest job when it comes to uh, working in the theater space because if the housing plot doesn't match his lighting plot, then he has to completely readjust what's uh, hanging above his space in order to uh, implement the right lighting design that he wants. And sometimes this is easy when you work off the winch line, but if you're not working on a winch line, you are hanging lights and leveling lights with equal weight and all pulling it by hand. And the lights are heavy, the cables are heavy, you have to wire the wires off stage without them flying in, and you have to make sure that it's all break even so it doesn't fall and hurt anyone on stage. So there's tons of disturbances that can be addressed uh, and implemented with electricity, but those are usually done at the beginning of a performance, like the winch line or any block sight lines and even like uh, humming spotlights. This is all usually muffled and done off stage, so it's not to hinder the audience's performance. And I touched on this here, but if an entire baton which holds the curtains or hangs a piece of equipment needs to be stripped for lighting technology, it needs to be level and equal with the counterweight system and all pulled by hand. And the heaviest that I pulled here at Shawnee State was roughly 600 pounds with two other people. If you want to say they helped, <laughs> um, it was very, very difficult and I do not recommend it. Use a winch line if you ever get the chance to work in a theater. So when it comes to hanging lights, uh, first thing that they do is they set the batten down to stage level, and then they set the instruments down in front of the batten that they need to hang. They put it up on the batten, screw it in finger tight with the seat clamp, and then they rotate and fix it and focus it the way they want it. And then finally, they put a safety chain around the batten to ensure that the light doesn't fall. And I should have a picture here, yes, of lighting instruments and how they're hung. 
So if you look here, this is where the C-clamp hangs from the batten, and this is the safety chain which hangs around the batten to secure it. Once you've hung the light, you actually have any range of motion that you'd like to uh, project it. You can shutter it in and then focus the light. You can project the light down further, and you can amplify the uh, beam itself, and you can even rotate and switch it and move it from the batten 360 degrees. Basically, the best way to put it is anywhere you want the light to go, you can make it go. Um, and there's provided more ways in which the light can hang. You can be seen. This is right underneath, and this is actually a good picture here because the light is hanging off the batten horizontally and hanging straight down. So there's all types of ways that a designer can implement these designs. And this is where the design is the most important aspect of the show. So lighting designers have plenty of effect on the audience experience which, when designing a show. And they've implemented their work in other aspects of life likewise. So not only do they work in a theater, but they also work in architectural design as well. And there's digital programs that these designers can use since the COVID-19 pandemic, which I touch on here briefly. So these digital designs help uh, lighting designers who are learning understand how light focuses and works in a space. However, more seasoned lighting designers have said that this is not a good way to learn how light works. The best way is through experience and hanging lights and working with lights, because only then can you really understand how the light moves in a space and experience is everything when it comes to any type of field you're working in especially when it comes to uh, lighting design if you rely only on the uh, computer and the computer programs you're not really going to get a focus on the, how the light is hung and how it works in a space and the virtual interface cannot be overlooked but as the slide here says the effect of a designer is best done in the theater so, the article I provide, Theatrical Lighting and the Architectural Lighting Design Profession, provides insight into other designers who have worked not only in theater, but architectural design as well. And they get their start in theater because that's where they have the free range to design all types of shows for all types of performers, and it helps give them a broad concept as to how light moves. And these designers have actually helped work in other spaces besides theaters. Um, as I previously mentioned, they've, uh, one of the best that I read was how a designer worked on the uh, Martin Luther King National Monument in DC. It's actually a very touching story. So finally, we touch on the most advanced technology, which is AR technology. And computers have been used to help simulate great designs and work for shows. And today, we use computers to fully immerse an audience in a show by using augmented and virtual reality. And this shift from traditional theater scenery to digital media is a massive step towards innovation and realism, but there is no limit to traditional theater technology. And when you use this uh, digital age, you have more of a broad range to work uh, for the desired effect you'd like. So there's a reference to a writer Theodore Shank, who writes, the purpose of theatrical artists is to use any and all possible resources to present virtual behavior as direct, visible, and audible experiences. And the full value of any dramatic piece lies in whether the onstage resources can be effectively used to simulate our real world from the outside, from outside the stage. And I think that resonates true as to what the designer's overall goal is. You do want something that is, you want something to understand that is a theatrical space, but you want to represent the real world in a story. And AR technologies have helped uh, implement the real world on stage. They create ideal effects and illusions without disrupting or drawing away from performances, and they don't really rely too heavily on the uh, broad technology. Uh, they do rely on the computer, uh, digital, and programming, but it isn't a true hindrance as to designing in a show. Even now, the digital age of theater has relied on audiences to use their cell phones to interact in a show and immerse the audience's experience. Um, this has become more modern in today's time as cell phones and computers have become more mainstream, but a lot of traditionalists have argued that that is a huge takeaway from the uh, traditionalist aspect of the here and now that is with theater. But 
it's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, I've always been one to uh, silence my cell phone before entering a movie or a performance space, just because I don't want to take away from the performers and I don't want to take away from any audience members. But some shows are now implementing that, yeah, you can partake in the show with us. You can perform with us. You can design the show yourself from, the, from your phone. Um, kind of a more innovation in today's time, uh, which I don't really know much more about other than that they implement your insight. So the use of traditional stage machinery as well as these advanced technologies help create a, uh, a broader sense of realism. And the use of LED screens have helped implement that. These LED screens can be on the flats that I mentioned prior, they can be flown in on the Arbor system, they can be wheeled in on sets, or they can be mainstream pieces during performance. And this has happened before in past Broadway shows, and it's only been recently implemented for the uh, sense of realism. By implementing both technical machinery and traditional stage machinery mechanics, you have the free range to create and design more as an artist. And these effects help create a more modern take on realism and create a uh, true effect for uh, audiences to really uh, enjoy a performance. AR is becoming slowly accepted with the uh, acceptance of AR by traditionalists to argue that relying on AR uh, VR technology blurs the boundary between drama and uh, the performer and the performance uh, and the audience. The uh, reliance on the technology is slowly, slowly uh, becoming mainstream and only now are traditionalists starting to implement traditional stagecraft with more modern AR VR technology and digital aspects of theater tech. So by now one can argue theater technology has evolved drastically over the centuries, uh, and the use of most recent and advanced technologies is slowly becoming accepted. But the audience is considered in all aspects of a theater. It doesn't matter what technology you want to use. If the audience wants to see it, they will, they will see it. And if you don't implement the most recent new technologies, the audiences won't care. And only recently, because uh, the argument made that technology is not absolutely necessary for all performances, and that only some technology is necessary for a performance. Uh, when you look at a street performer or an improvisation, they don't really have a lot of technology, yet some of them give some of the best performances and receive some of the best uh, cash flow that they've ever seen by the use of less technology. And audiences can have a profound and fully beneficial experience with the limited yet fulfilling restrictions like the classical Greek era, where they still use the mask, they use all male cast, and they use three act plays there's still that antiquity and that sense of uh, being in the moment of theater with the use of less technology. And only recently has it started to become more mainstream to uh, hinder and use the uh, more advanced technologies. So here's our concluding, state, concluding statement. Um, the use of this technology is only necessary when the technology in question produces a needed or desired effect. Uh, even the most or advanced or expensive technology does not need to be uh, necessary for all performances. As we've discussed, a performance can be restricted to the precursor or past technologies in order to help convey a sense of historical accuracy. And today, modern digital theater and AR VR technologies are slowly becoming accepted and re revolutionized in theatrical pieces. And these, uh, the use of this technology is creating a more authentic and realistic uh, effect for performers to perform and audiences to enjoy a performance and develop a show. I'd like to thank uh, Jason Cheney, the technical advisor, director, and house manager at the uh, Burn Rive Center for the Arts for providing the photos needed for my presentation. And listed here is my bibliography. If you guys have any questions about my presentation or any of the information I've provided, I'm happy to answer. Uh, you could send me a message directly or email me uh, on my school email. Thank you so much, and I hope you all enjoy.